Well, I don't have any special words prepared, but uh, I mean, for the sermon I do. Uh, tomorrow is uh, our 18th wedding, the anniversary, yeah. 18 years finished. And uh, thank you to Yumi and to God. By far the best 18 years of my life. And uh, you make life good, honey. I really appreciate that. I'm really right now wishing that the things in my heart were coming out, but... I still enjoy every day with this woman. Okay, my sermon today is Highway to Hell. (laughs) Blame Jesus, it's next. Let's pray, uh, because this, joking aside, in, and I don't want to do a disservice to, to what God has put in the word here, the message that Jesus Christ spoke, uh, incredibly, incredibly important topic, and brothers, sisters, friends, if you don't get this right, if you don't get this right, It's tragedy. There is nothing more important you will do in your life than to get this right. More important than the person you marry. More important than becoming any job you could get, any house you could purchase, any place you could move. The things we think are important, education, all those things, you know, nothing is as important is getting right with the Lord because your eternal destiny hangs in the balance. And I don't want anybody to assume, well, I go to Foundation Bible Church. It's a Bible church, so I'm okay. I hope nobody just assumes that because you there's a pew with your imprint and because you come here on a Sunday morning and suck some air, that that means you're right with Almighty God. Listen. We can be very religious. We can go through a lot of... We can see miraculous things occur in our life and still not be right with the Lord. This is a danger. This is a warning. And if you're wondering, well, why is he doing this? It's because Christ saw fit to give this danger and to give this warning and to give this invitation to real life. So... We need to pray, and we're going to invite the Holy Spirit. If you're a long-time believer, we're going to invite the Holy Spirit to shake us and wake us up and stop wasting our days. And if you've been in the church a long time, but every once in a while, you get this suspicion, maybe, maybe, I really don't know God. Well, we can fix that today. Doors of heaven are wide open. Is the door in my heart open or closed? Let's pray. Lord God, we're not, uh, we we know ourselves, Father. We see, we see how we struggle with so many things that should be easy. Being patient, truly caring about others instead of being self-centered, being correctable instead of easily offended. Lord, even, your Bible says, even our righteousness, our our good things are, are like filthy rags. When we come before you, God, in your perfection, your holiness, and we bring all of these good works and the things that we've done right, they're still all tainted, Lord God, by this hard-headed, self 
righteousness within us. Father, the things we approach today, they're too high for us. Lord, we need, we need your Holy Spirit, Father, because we cannot, we cannot do this alone. Lord God, please don't let me lead people into error. Father, please uh, let your Holy Spirit work powerfully. If I speak in error, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit works so powerfully here today, Lord, that, that you just guide them to truth anyways. Father, we invite you this morning to grab a hold of us. Do something fresh and new in our hearts, in our souls. Lord, we, we want to see you this morning. We want to encounter you. We don't want to have a nice religious time. We don't want to come here, Lord, and just check off our weekly spiritual activity. Father, we believe that you are so great. You are so powerful. You are so beautiful. You are so good that there's no way we can approach you where there's no way we can draw near to you, Lord, without being profoundly affected. It's impossible. So, Lord, I pray that we encounter you today as you really are, that we don't, we don't play religious games, Father, but that your Holy Spirit would crack open weary hearts, tired hearts, bored hearts, hearts full of fear and concern and worries and pressures. Lord, and if any of us here this morning are watching on television or on the Internet, Lord, if any of us... don't know you, Father, aren't sure that we've made our peace with you, Father, I pray that today that we'll get that done, that we'll, we'll, we won't delay another moment, but we'll come to you, Lord, fall at the foot of the cross and embrace your love and mercy that Jesus Christ bought for us with his blood. Thank you, God, that you're a Lord who always hears our prayers even when we're confused and we don't know how to pray, we don't know the words to say, you always hear, Lord God. Please work in us this morning. We ask this in your holy and precious name. Amen. All right, well, today we're going to be finishing up the Sermon on the Mount. Like I said before, this is, this is a hellfire message. This is a hellfire message. And I, I really, really wish, and, and I, I don't, I don't want to let the devil get the advantage here or, or depress me or put me down. I wish you had a, a better preacher today because this, this is so important. And, and the people in this room, there are going to be people who miss this. And it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. There are going to be people who, who, who fade away, who get distracted by cute children. There's going to be people who who because of years and years of a, of a faulty theology are not going to be able to hear what I'm saying this morning. And, and I just wish you had a, a better preacher. I wish there was somebody up here who could present it uh, more clearly in a more profound way and maybe somebody who's more dy dynamic. But you don't. And, and I'm here. And so, Lord God, uh, I'll have to do. But I will covenant with you. I'm going to do my best today I'm going to do my best today and in turn in turn I want you to promise to engage to stay alert ask the Holy Spirit for help ask the Holy Spirit to lead you the message today covers the most important part of the most important sermon ever given it's a big deal a couple months ago, I, I asked you to imagine what it would be like to be in that first century church, or maybe second century church, and, and you heard the book of Matthew, and it had just been carried in by couriers for the very first time the book of Matthew is being read, and how would it have been to be in that church and to be impacted by these words and to hear about the life of Christ? And then several weeks ago, I asked you to imagine that you were actually with Christ on the mountainside, when he, when he sat down and gave his first recorded sermon. The first recorded sermon. Think about that. God in flesh. God coming down to a world of tears and heartache and death. 
What does God want to say to us? And this is Christ's first recorded public message. And he started off with the Beatitudes, the attitudes. He said, says, here's my kingdom. This is what I want to establish here on earth. This is what I want in your heart. Are you a believer? Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? This is what I want in your heart. And it starts off right away with admitting our, that we are spiritually bankrupt and finding blessing and peace and joy by coming to God honestly and saying, I'm poor in spirit, Lord. And he goes through these steps of all the things that he desires from us and and teaches us how to pray. And now Christ is culminating. He's, he's putting this, the final exclamation point on the sermon uh, on the mountainside 2,000 years ago. Christ came to establish, establish the kingdom of God in your family. God's kingdom in your heart. No Christian should ever go to a, a workplace or a school and say, this is a God-forsaken place. Not if the kingdom of God resides in you. God wants to establish the kingdom of God in his people, in his church, in this world. He didn't come so that people could say they believe in God. Well, I believe in God. And live as if they were functionally uh, atheists, apatheists, right? Apathetic theists. Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew 6, 9 through 10. Pray then in this way. Here's how you pray. Our Father who is in heaven, your name is holy. Lord God, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth right here as it is in heaven. The Sermon on the Mountainside is about God sitting down on a mountain and telling people what his kingdom is all about. I watched a, a video of a preacher giving a sermon on this part of the Sermon on the Mount, and he said that the self-esteem of his listeners doesn't really concern him. You ever notice that the Bible doesn't spend a lot of time with our self-esteem? Modern, modern Christianity does. I don't think that's all bad. It's not wrong. It's just not the meat and potatoes that we get right here. He said he's not concerned if they have a balanced checkbook. That didn't bother him. The only thing that troubled him in his soul, and he said, the reason I can't sleep sometimes, is that within 100 years, the great majority of the people who heard this message would be in hell. The pastor goes on to quote Billy Graham, who has stated that the vast majority of the people who attend church are going to hell. vast majority of Americans don't go to church. Not regularly. And then the vast majority of the people who, who attend church, according to Billy Graham, are going to hell. Graham further states that if even 5% of the people who came forward at one of his crusades was truly saved, he would be happy. I know his heart. I'm guessing he'll get to heaven and be really, really happy. But you see his point the point is, is uh, do you want to go to heaven? Yeah, where do I sign? Whew, now I can forget about that. Saying, there's no such thing as a magic prayer that's like, you know, you have fire insurance, you have flood insurance, now I've got hell insurance because I signed a piece of paper. Stay with me. This is important. We've often said getting saved is more like falling in love than following a cooking recipe. Check, 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 check. I've got cookies. Do you love the Lord? Do his ways wrap up your heart and your mind? Is the passion of your life to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ? Do you, he, he loved sinners from the cross, and are we learning to love other people? Are we find it so easy to sit in condemnation and judgment and cut people off and say, the heck with them, I'm done with it. Are we loving the way Jesus Christ has loved us? Well, how could it be that millions of people could be sitting in church and not really be connected with the Lord? 
Doesn't, doesn't the Bible say in Romans 10, 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved? Who believes that Bible verse? I hope you all do. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, it doesn't say, it doesn't say 50%. It doesn't say 80%. It doesn't say 99.9%. Call on the name of the Lord and there's a good chance you're going to be saved. No. Call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Yet right here in chapter 7, we're about to hear Jesus Christ say, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. So, uh, boy, it can't be both. Which is it? Can't both be true, can they? Well, actually, yes, they can. Uh, they are both true, and Jesus actually covers this in his conclusion to the message on establishing the kingdom of God. So how will Jesus end his first recorded public sermon? Sermon. We believe he is from heaven. He is God in the flesh. He came to earth for a reason. What did he have to say to us? It's not an exaggeration to say where you spend your eternal destination depends on how you respond to Jesus Christ. John MacArthur, famous Bible teacher, said there are two things you, t you can't do with the Sermon on the Mount. Two things. One is you cannot stand back and admire it. Jesus is not interested in folks who want to admire the virtues of the ethical statement of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus wants a decision about your destiny. Brothers and sisters, today, if you haven't made that decision yet, when I pray at the end of the sermon, join with me, pray, surrender your hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ, and get this done. Jesus Christ wants a decision. He was sitting in front of those thousands of people on the Sermon on the Mount, and he wanted them to decide, not to sit back and say, oh, that's a oh, good job. You're a, you're a super wonderful teacher. For some reason, I tripped out of my, my more words because Japanese was going to come out again. I have no idea why that happens sometimes. I believe there's a second thing John MacArthur goes on to say that you can't do with the Sermon on the Mount and that is to push it into some prophetic tomorrow. I don't think Jesus is suggesting that this is for some far future era when the glorious kingdom of God is here. He's demanding a decision now. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 7, 7 through 28. Matthew chapter 7, 7 through 28. Actually, uh, for time's sake, we're going to skip down to verse 13. Chapter 7 from verse 13. Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. If you grew up in church, you heard that verse too many times. That's a shocking verse. Jesus Christ is about to wrap up his sermon with thousands of people sitting in front of him. The burden of his heart, the desire, what God wants to let them know is say, listen, listen. It's easy to go to hell. Lots of people. It's a broad road. Wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Have you found the road that leads to eternal life? It's a small road, a narrow path. Watch out for false prophets. They will come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. This has nothing to do with your pastor being named Wolf. Uh, By their fruit you will recognize them. Do not pick grapes from, do, do people pick grapes from thorn bushes? And you're supposed to say, <laughs> no. Or figs from thistles? No. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, 
but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, the test, the test, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And what were the people there thinking on the side of the Sermon on the Mount? And the people we talked about in that first century church who were hearing the book of Matthew read for the first time, what did they hear when that not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven? Now remember, the, uh, we talked about this before, many of Paul's letters were written before the book of Matthew was written. So they would have been familiar uh, with Paul's writing on grace. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father will enter into it. Well, what's that? Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into heaven, but only those who do the will will enter the kingdom. So what is this? Is this Christ saying you're only saved by your works? No. You cannot be saved by your good works. It's absolutely impossible. God is so holy. God is so beautiful. And we at our best fall so far short. His standard is perfection, absolute, and none of us can bring that to him. Verse, seven, uh, verse 21 again. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only, only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, again, this, this emphasizing, Lord, Lord, I said, I, I called upon you. Did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And Jesus doesn't argue with them. Instead, he says, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. What a scary, scary, this should shake you to your core. What a scary thought. Lord, I did the religious thing. Didn't I go to church? Didn't I sing in the choir? Didn't I read my Bible? Didn't, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we drive out demons? Didn't we perform many miracles? Religious, spiritual things. And Jesus said, get away from here. I never knew you. Now, did you see what just happened? People say, oh, this is about salvation by works. And then Jesus says, you did this work, and you did that work, and you did this work. Get away from me, because I never knew you. It's about a relationship with the Lord. People say, God, I did this, and I did that, and I did this. He says, get away from you. Get away from me. I never knew you. And what sad, tragic words to hear. Therefore, 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 based on what we just read, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, everyone who hears these words and what? Puts them into practice. is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. I'm loud today. I know that. I'm trying to break through apathy and years of bad theology. Put it into practice. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine, they hear the words, and they do not put them into practice, is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains came down, the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell. It did not stand. It fell with a great crash. And incidentally, this is one of the passages where we get the name of our church from, Foundation Bible Church. It's the teaching of Christ. It's Jesus Christ. is the foundation for our lives. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as one of their teachers of the law. So what is it? Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord is saved, and not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. How can these both be true? Well, I want to I tell you something. It's a secret. The letters 
of the alphabet, L-O-R-D, they're not magic. They're not magic. You could say, Lord, 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 till you're blue in the face. And say, I don't want, God's not going to tell me what to do. I don't want anything to do with God's. So the question is, how are you saved? You're saved by faith. So I want to ask you, if somebody's saying, Lord, 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 I believe you. And I'm not going to do a thing you say, and I don't care about what you say, and I'm not going to confess, I'm not going to repent. I'm going to live in the hardness of my heart. Does that sound like faith to you? It does not. Lord, Lord, Lord. Paul is saying, if you say, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, you are my Lord, and I see my life is bankrupt, and I see your way is perfect, and I want to live for you, and yes, I stumble, but you paid for that on the cross. Your grace is sufficient for me. You're, I want to follow you all the days of my life. You are my Lord. That person saying, Lord, from their heart, from their soul, that's real. But somebody going through religious routines and rituals and, and, and even seeing miracles in their church and around them, and they're, and they're saying, Lord, Lord, and they've never humbled themselves to the Lord. Hard. Not good at repenting. Well, that term Lord is meaningless. That's a redefinition of the word Lord. It doesn't mean anything. I, I was thinking about this. How can I frame this? And, and I was thinking about being in a, a pit. You're down in a pit, right? And, and you cannot climb out of there. You can jump. You could be the best athlete in the world and leap up there. The walls are slippery, they're slick. There's no way you can get out. In other words, you can't save yourself, okay? You can't save yourself. And every once in a while, you start to notice the water level is kind of increasing, first by your toes and your ankles, and suddenly a rope drops down. You look up there, there's a rescue guy. He's got a beard, and he's got JC written right here. I, I don't know what that stands for. And he, he's up there, and he says, listen, I can get you out of there. You cannot save yourself. Grab a hold of this rope, and I'll pull you up. And you say, I really believe that you can pull me up. And you start whistling, maybe doing a little tap dance, splashing in the water. And, and Jesus says, you don't want to be splashing in that water. You're going to drown down there. <laughs> it's coming up. I really believe I'm going to drown down here. Don't grab a hold of rope. Grab a hold of rope. I will pull you out. You cannot save yourself. Now you start to tread water. <laughs> Obviously, I'm going to die here. I totally believe you. And never having grabbed a hold of that rope. Is that faith? Is that faith? We're saved by works? No. You're not saved because you grabbed the rope. You're saved because Christ taught it down, th tossed it down, and you, by faith, grabbed a hold of what he's done for you. Your works don't save you. Never have, never will, never can. Jesus Christ can save. And we need to ask ourselves, have I responded or not? It's not enough to say, I sure do believe you, And not care. Jesus Christ says, build your life on me. That's faith. By saying, I want to build my life on Christ. I'm not going to build my life on my culture's values. I'm not going to build my life on my dreams. I'm going to build my life on Christ. That's saying, I trust you, God. Your way is better than my way. But we prefer to say, well, I believe God. I sign the insurance paper, and I'm going to live however the heck I want. And does that sound like faith? Does God look down from heaven and say, that person really trusts me? It doesn't look like trust. It doesn't look like faith. Not in the way we use these words for anything else than God. For some reason, we get to religion, and we, may, and we change definitions for the word trust. We don't trust God if we don't want any part of his will for our lives. When Jesus spoke on that mountainside 2,000 years ago, he wound up this wonderful sermon by saying, basically, don't just listen to me. Choose to follow me. It was time for those people on the mountainside to make up their minds. 
And when that small first century church got their first copy of the book of Matthew, and they were so excited, and they were, they were listening, and they heard Christ's first public sermon, and it was, were, it was being read to them, and they got to this point, each one of those listeners would have been challenged. Which gate did they choose? The wide road that leads to destruction. It's not me. <coughs> it's not me saying that the, the, the road to hell is wide. That's God in flesh saying you got to know this. You have to know this. And they had a decision to make. And so it's been ever since in every generation and all over the world when Christ's words have been taught, people are faced with a choice as we are this morning. And everybody who's listening to this is faced with a choice. Friends, there are two paths ahead of you. There's a wide road. It's easy to travel. You have a lot of company. Believe in God, check. Christ says that path leads to eternal destruction. Then there's a narrow path, less traveled, that leads to eternal life. Brothers and sisters, which one are you going to choose? Christ told us that the person who hears his message and puts it into practice and chooses to obey God's will is like a wise man building his house on the rock. When I look at, when I look at Jesus Christ, I see somebody who loved me enough to die for me. I see his goodness. I see his perfection. I think I can trust him. When I look at myself, I don't trust myself. When I look at modern day religion, I don't trust that. Don't trust my culture. In fact, the only place I see worthy of trust and faith, where those words are in our lexicon. The only place where I can use those words fully and completely are with Jesus Christ. God deserves my trust. God deserves my faith. Why did Jesus Christ die on the cross? To save us. If you could be good enough to, to save yourself, to get to heaven based on your own good deeds, Jesus Christ would not have had to go to the cross. Brothers, sisters, we tend to underestimate our own sin nature. God says we're so lost that only the death of God, God incarnate, God bleeding for us, God taking responsibility for our sins, only that could save us. Don't underestimate our fallenness. Lord God, I'm broken. I'm profoundly messed up. Lord, all these, even when I'm doing something good, Lord, there's all these different motives and all these other things, and I can be so petty and bitter and self-righteous and hard-headed and critical and, and full of greed and lust and all of these other things. Lord God, I need a Savior. And then we say, somebody who would die for me, I can trust them. And somebody who not only died, but three days later rose up out of the grave triumphant because his love was so strong that death couldn't hold it down. And he said, come with me. I love you. Take my hand. And I'm going to say, I'm going to respond to that kind of love. I'm going to put my faith in Jesus Christ. And I see that his way is so much better than my way. It's like hearing music from heaven and saying, okay, I'll dance. We look at our lives. We look at the Lord. We look at our culture around us. We see the broad road. It's flat. So many people have walked on it. It's easy. It's easy to go with the flow, go with the crowd. Or Christ says over here, admit your sin, confess your fallenness, and come to me and trust me. My ways are better. We say, yeah. Lord God, your ways have to be better than my ways because I'm so messed up. Lord, forgive. Lord, forgive. And God is quick to forgive. And God says, come to me, my child. Come to me, my son. Come to me, my daughter. 
and we will find forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Forgiveness. Are you carrying guilt? Are you carrying a burden? Forgiveness. The blood of Jesus Christ, far greater than all of our sins put together. He can do what we can't do. And I'm going to trust that because I don't see anything else to trust. Not in here, not out there. Friends, get this right. Get this right. Let's humble ourselves in front of the cross of Jesus Christ and cry out and say truly from our hearts, you are Lord. You are Lord. And I want to build my life on you. Right now we're going to bow our heads and close our eyes. And I'm going to invite you to pray with me. If we're, if we're a longtime Christian, we're going to say, God, revitalize my life because I want to live for you. And if you're not sure, pray with me, and we'll get that done. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ spoke these amazing words on that hillside 2,000 years ago, and all those people were left with a choice. He said the majority of the people would follow this path to destruction. Lord, we can see it in our own lives, this gravity, this pull towards destruction. And at the same time, we know there's something better. We know that there's goodness, that there's something higher than ourselves. God, help us to choose that, choose that narrow path. Let's go, help us to go through the gate that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Help us to go through the gate that he opened with his sacrifice on the cross. Lord, we don't want to pay for our sins ourselves. We could never do it anyways. But he paid for our sins. Lord God, we come before you this morning and we confess our fallenness. We confess that we're sinners. We confess that we're messed up. And Father, we have no other recourse. We have no other place to run because you have life. We come before you and say, Lord God, forgive us. Fill us up with your Holy Spirit. Teach us your ways. Your ways are better than our ways. Help us to build our lives on your truth. Help us to be filled up with your love. We want to love you, God, more than anything else. And we want to love other people, Lord. And it's so hard for us. Father, we confess our weakness. And we confess that, Lord, we want to trust you and love you. Lord God, we invite your Holy Spirit into our lives to work through us and in us. Father, we ask that you would establish the kingdom of God in our hearts, that your kingdom would reign in our families, that we wouldn't do family life the way we see on television or the way it is in our culture, Lord God, but that your kingdom would rule our families. And Lord God, we pray that you will bring your kingdom to our country, that as a nation that we would humble ourselves and truly call out to you and and say, Lord, we're, we're a broken people. And we've been so self-righteous, Lord. And we've, the blood of all these innocent children are on our hands, Lord. Father, our ways are wrong. We're wicked. We repent, Lord, and turn to you. Lord, please bless us. Please draw us close to you. And Father, we ask more than anything, more than anything, that you would teach us and guide us and lead us and help us to truly be your people. Because Father, we don't want to hear Christ say to us, depart from me, I never knew you. Instead, we long to hear from you, Lord, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And Father, we know we have no hope on our own. So we come to you in faith, in trust, dependent upon you, Lord. trusting in your goodness. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.
Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.